most speakers say you should probably wait on the applause till the end. So you, you think I deserve anything? Um, but it is really a pleasure for me to be here. It's it's really an honor for me to be back in South Dakota. I'm a native of the state, but had been away for a long time with NRCS to get to come back and be here now. Ten months, which seems to be honest, just like ten days. It's gone so fast. But it's a pleasure to be here, and I've been getting a chance to get out across the state and spend some time and working with producers. And in my job as state conservationist, riff, roughly the way I see it is I just get to work with a great group of people, about 220 to 230 NRCS employees, all trying to work with the producers of the state, trying to put conservation on the land. You know, not only to protect your livelihood, but protect your natural resources which really ties to livelihood. So I think my task here today is to just share a few thoughts with you about NRCS and who we are and some of the things that we see as challenges in the future, and then talk with you a little bit about what we're really focusing on as a direction for our agency for the next several years. And it's gonna be all kind of related to that little demonstration up there and a couple little videos. So part of my job might also be to challenge some of your thinking there might be some things that I share with you today that you might think is BS, and if you want to say to me it's BS, that's fine. Um, you know, I think in a lot of cases when we, we're learning a lot about conservation, we don't know everything there is to know about how Mother Nature does stuff. We learn all the time. Every time you think you know everything, she usually teaches you different. But I know just in having discussions even with my own father on his farm, sometimes the things that I tell him that I think are the right things for conservation or what we know about uh, the knowledge of conservation today, you know, sometimes he goes, that's not the way I remember it at all, you know, and so we have those discussions. So I might ch I might say some things today that you might think are a little off, and we'll talk about them, and we'll try to work through that. But anyway, I'm just happy to have a little bit of your time. You know, really, ma many of you know that we offer a diverse group of programs to help on conservation on private land, but I really believe that the most important resource and program we have to offer is our technical assistance. And that's just our people in our offices providing advice. And I really encourage you to use that service. I know I, a lot of our field people say that any more producers come in and say, can I get some money to do this? I'm encouraging you, some of you to just come in the office and say, can I get some advice on my situation on this? Because I think we have some of that expertise and we will learn a lot together. If I just look real quickly at some South Dakota figures, I want to make a few points. 49 million acres, we've got some land tied up in reservations, of course, and federal land, state land. But 73 or close to 75%, three quarters of our land is privately owned. So if we're going to protect natural resources, if we're going to provide wildlife habitat, if we're going to provide clean water, it has to happen on private lands because that's where it's at. And that's really what our agency is all about. You know, quickly, when you just think about the number of producers that we have and the farms across the state, <coughs> the impact on the overall economy for the state, $21 billion, 20% 20 of our overall, and the jobs that it provides, agriculture really is the number one industry of the state. The point that I'd make is it all relies on natural resources. We're not going to really be able to accomplish that number one industry if we don't rely and take care of our natural resources. At NRCS, we really focus on all of the resources. You know, sometimes we focus a little bit more on different things at different times. You, the private landowner, are always the focal point of those discussions, but we try to tie it all together. There's going to be really a renewed emphasis, I think, by our staff on the soil resource. It was kind of, those of you that have been around as long as me, our name used to be the Soil Conservation Service. Now we're NRCS, which ties them all together. But we're going to have a renewed focus on that soil part. We don't do all this work alone, of course, you know that. We do it with the districts. The districts are, some of them are represented here today. Um, there's many other groups that all tie together and we all try to provide good service to you as landowners. I go back to that technical assistance. I really believe it's the number one thing we have to offer you. It's really that one-on-one -on -one, um, farm plan for you based on your goals. It's free assistance, doesn't require any particular participation, it's just advice. You know, you can take and leave some of the advice we give, but we would hope that you'd find some of it valuable and maybe be able to assist your operation. A couple things that I want to just talk to you about, kind of like looking ahead, the future a little bit. I think some of the things that we're all going to face, and it really means, when I say all, it's really all of us that live in South Dakota, regardless whether we're on uh, an agricultural operation or whether we live in Sioux Falls 
But the fact of the matter is, is that the population is going to grow rapidly. And it's going, there's projections that say that with the current population growth, that we're going to have to improve or raise the level of food and fiber production by 70%. That's challenging. That strikes me as a challenge when we're not creating any new land. And actually, we're losing land when you think about it in some ways. Between 82 and 2007, 25-year period, we lost 14 million acres of prime farmland, not just farmland, prime farmland to development. And that's land that we're not going to be able to raise those crops on to get to that 70% boost. When you think about the fact fertilizers and you look at what it's going to take to grow more food, we import now much of our fertilizer in this country. So when you just take and put all these things together in these issues, it's like we're going to have to find a focus that's going to lead us forward. I don't think it's any more, I don't think it's the job of NRCS or Jeff Simpert State Conservationist anymore to talk about how we sustain our resources. I almost have to figure out ways I think that we can actually improve our natural resources to, to develop ways that we can, we'll, we'll be able to raise more food instead of just maintaining the level. I don't think maintaining the level is going to be good enough. So that's why you're going to hear NRCS focus a lot on healthy soil. And it's, it's really going to be an initiative that happens across the country, but you're going to see the focus in South Dakota as well. And we just believe that it's the opportunity for us to maybe really look at resources and take them even to the next level. Actually, at the same time, with sustaining them. Not take them at, to the next level in production that we mine them to where we lose their ability to sustain themselves, but we actually protect them and take them to the next level. So, I want to talk just a few uh, benefits. I'm going to do this really quick, and then I'm going to kind of get to some of these demonstrations and, and get a little bit more discussion. We believe that when you have healthy soils, you can improve water quality. I'll talk about that in a little bit. You can really have an impact on downstream flooding and the amount of water you hold on a, on a farm or a ranch. We've got the whole recycling of nutrients. We can increase soil carbon. By do that, we can actually pull carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. That's actually good for you. The more carbon dioxide, the more uh, car uh, carbon matter, organic matter you have in your soil, the better it's going to be at raising food, the better it's going to be at infiltrating water and many other things. We can save energy. We can save water. That means that we can kind of bounce back from drought. I really believe that soil health has a lot to do about being resilient from drought. And I'll try to make some of those points a little bit. We think that we can improve income, make it sustainable, have plant health. We can improve wildlife habitat. We can reduce disease and pest problems. So we just see a lot of positives. Soil health is not just about cropland. Some people might believe that it's about rangeland as well. The connections are there the same, and we'll focus on them in a little bit. And Jason and others later will focus on this some more as well. But the bottom line: if we do good management practices on the surface, if you do those things that you're probably very aware of many of you are probably doing them, you will see a difference in the soil health. And when you see that difference in the soil health, you're going to see a difference in rainfall management. And that's one thing that I think we're going to try to focus on a lot more in this state and really mention this word rainfall management a lot, infiltration. Some people will say, somebody told me just today, this morning, they said they heard a speaker talk about that in this country we have a runoff problem. We have too much water running off. Well, what I really think is that means we have an infiltration problem. Because if we don't get if we can get that water to infiltrate into the soil, we don't have a runoff problem at all. Excess except in really excessive events. And none of us can plan for those real excessive events. We can plan for the normal events. Okay? So what I want to do is I've got a video of kind of the same thing over here on the tabletop. But this is a cropland. It's got a speaker type, or it's got some volume issues here a little bit. We didn't bring speakers for it, so you'll have to be kind of quiet and listen. But I want to have Jeff Hemingway, our soil quality specialist, kind of do this demonstration for you. We'll play with the same thing over here on the tabletop on a rangeland. This is rangeland over here. This is cropland. And then we'll just kind of get talking about this discussion a little bit. My name is Jeff Hemingway. I'm the soil quality specialist here in South Dakota. And, and today we're going to actually go through our, our uh, soil, uh, soil tabletop export model. Uh, really, the, the model is really designed to do just this, is that 
really look at infiltration and that sport development uh, among soils uh, with different management scenarios. And, and it's a very simple model to run. We really like to do this, this, this model because of its simplicity. But uh, let me show you what we're talking about. Uh, first of all, this is our soil cutter, a four inch deep soil cutter. We can drive that into any field and drive it down flush to the soil surface and then take a shovel, a spade, and actually remove the sample, slice it off along the bottom. So it's a fairly simple sample to pull. In addition to that, we actually have a no-till field that we actually cut a pulling sample out of. This field uh, has been in no-till for 14 years in a corn, soybean, wheat rotation. In fact, it has wheat on it last year. It has telescopes planted on it. And you can see the surface residue. You can also see, and we'll turn this over a little bit here so we can actually see the base. You can actually see that the soil is exposed on the bottom. You can see that we actually have some really good soil structure. We can see that we have some macropores that are exposed. We know that macropores are a wormhole, those kinds of a biological activity. Really pretty good looking soil sample. Put that back down here. Take a look at our conventionally filled sample. Okay. As we take this apart and we look at our conventionally tilled uh, soil sample, what I mean by that is that this field was actually in no-till a number of years ago, and now it's actually been tilled up the last couple of years. And we can actually see that by looking at this soil sample. And one of the striking differences you can actually see here is that there is very little to no surface residues um, on this sample. And I'd like to put this one over for you a little bit more, but the soil is fairly loose on the surface. But I don't know if you can see that. But as we start looking at the base of this sample, it has a, a very poor structure associated with, with, the, with the soil in the surface. So the, like I say, the whole idea behind this model is to look at water that is either infiltrating or running off soils, uh, same soil in this particular case, different management scenarios. Uh, we'll just put it back together here. And uh, the whole idea about the model is the simplicity. Uh, you can actually see that it's designed that we're actually going to, in the sprinkler system here, you can see that there's holes in this tray above. We're going to actually move water back to that, that profile, sprinkle water onto the sample, have it either run off or infiltrate. Okay, let's just add water and see what happens. we actually really notice is the amount of runoff and the very drastic amount, not just the amount of runoff, but the sediments that's associated with the runoff coming off these samples. You can see here that this sample has very little runoff coming off it at all. And this one actually has quite a bit of sample of runoff. This is our conventionally tilled. Because that surface residue is not protecting that soil surface, we end up with that process of detachment and transport <clears throat> of eroded sediments up that water erosion process. Very visual in, in this particular case where we see that very little runoff actually occurred. We had a lot of that water being infiltrated through this sample. And over here we had most of that water actually ran off and carried soil sediment. When we start looking at that difference between here and here, it's just, it's just really, really striking. Uh, that no-till scenario, we not only had very, very uh, well, frankly, very little to no sediment actually uh, being transported off. And that water actually then was infiltrated through. We'll just take a look at that real quick here. Uh, the no-till sample here. As you can see again, we talked about all that surface residue uh, before. And if we turn over this sample and look at the base of the sample, you can see that the bottom of the sample is very wet. Made some natural pores where we actually have that water moving down through that soil profile. Actually, see some of those massive pores, and that water is infiltrated through that soil and was moved down into the lower profiles, being available for crop production. If you look at the tray, the catchment tray, also, you can see that the amount of infiltrated water 90% of it actually went through the soil sample and uh, moved into the tray below, or would then have been moved into the lower in the soil profile. Conversely, as we start really looking at our, our conventionally tilled sample, you can actually see here, first of all, the salt surface, uh, how puddled that salt surface is, and how much sediment that's actually moved off. You can actually see that, that we have sediment still remaining up in our funnel. 
And of course, in our catchment tray, we end up with a lot of sediment that come off the stem. If we look at the base of this sample, um, it's not, not wet at all. And in fact, if we start looking at the sample, you can see that we have dry soil clods. We have a little run over the side there. Water did not go through the soil profile at all, sealed off. And of course, that's pretty evident by looking at the amount of runoff we actually had up front also. So this is a really, uh, really um, very simple, convenient model for us to use, mainly because it's, 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 it's very visual. It shows what we're talking about as far as max core development, aggregate stability, and surface residues, how they interact uh, to uh, really affect the amount of runoff and erosion we have on our landscape. So again, we really like this model. Uh, very visual, and uh, we'll have fun to run this one. Great. Let's talk about that for just a second. When I when I give that presentation or show that video at times, I think there's a lot of folks in the audience that are going to say, okay, here's Zimprich. He's from the Natural Resources Conservation Service. He's from the federal government. And the first thing he's going to want to talk to us about is all that sediment that ran off that one site. To be totally honest, I'm not going to focus on that sediment. Um, I don't really believe the job of the Natural Resources Conservation Service is to worry as much about being dirt cops. I know some people in the past have called us dirt cops when highly erodible land provisions come in. I want you to focus on the amount of water. And I would just say to you this, if you were going to try to raise a corn crop on one of those fields, or a wheat crop on one of those fields, or a soybean crop on one of those fields, which one would you want to rent? Which one would you want to be farmed? Focus on that. If we focus on the water going into the soil, that water running off and that water carrying that soil off, that's, that's the least of our worries. I think it's so important for us in South Dakota to find ways that we can be selfish. I want you to all be selfish and capture every bit of water that falls on your farm, falls on your ranch, and get it in the soil because that's what's going to be there to raise a crop or raise grass for your livestock. Okay? That's what I would kind of ask you to take home. Now, I know on that cropland setting, I did this uh, demonstration using cropland a few uh, weeks ago in Mitchell, and a gentleman came up to me. And he said, you know, I have visited with other people that have showed me things just the opposite. Um, especially if I'm looking at maybe buying a piece of tillage equipment. They might tell me that if I loosen the soil up, that it will actually help infiltrate more water into the soil. And I will tell you that, there, you know, I think there's some truth and there's a connection to that for a while. It, like the first storm. You know, if you loosen something up and then pour something into it, it will absorb more the first storm. It's the storm after that, or the rain after that, and the rain after that, and the rain after that that you really have to think about. It's when you till something up and you make it loose, it's going to seal. It's not going to have those macropores. It's going to help that water get in the soil. So I know that you might hear, you might see, somebody might tell you different things, and that's where what we really need to do, is I believe that's where we need our universities and our educational you know, places that do more research to actually help prove this long term. Soon what we're going to do is we're going to try to start getting developed little rainfall, what we're going to call rainfill infiltration kits. And we hope that we'd have enough. I would have loved to have enough to give to each one of you today. And what I'd love to have you do is just go home with that and just try it on your place. Go to a place where you believe that if it's on a grazing land situation, you really have taken care of this past, past your well. Um, it could even be in a, a fence row system, an area that's excluded some. Pound, we'll just give you a ring. You can pound it in the ground. You can pour some water on it and see how fast the water goes in. Take it to another pasture and try it there. Go to a cropland field. If you're a no-tiller, go to your neighbor who's not a no-tiller and try it there and just see the differences. I think we're going to start to pick up some remarked differences just based on how the surface of the land is being managed. And I just want us to do that because I think the more we do that, the better off we're going to be at infiltrating water, which is going to mean we're going to be able to grow more grass, grow more corn, soybeans, wheat, whatever it needs to be. Okay? Questions on that at all? I'll stop right there and just ask if there's any basic questions on what you just seen. Otherwise, we're going to turn around here and do it. I'm going to talk for a little bit, and we're going to play with this game up here on the table. <clears throat> Remember, don't be afraid to challenge me. What would we expect off of a sod sample? 
We're going to play that here in just a second, show you the same thing. Actually, you know, I think that the, what was in my brain early on, and they, they made the statement that I'm a range management specialist by training years and years ago. Um, my thought would always be that grassland situation is going to always be better than cropland. But I'm seeing some results that are saying that if you take care of cropland well, if you do all the soil health things well in cropland, it may not totally ever be as good as a really pristine native rangeland situation or a well-managed rangeland situation, but it can definitely be better than a poorly managed rangeland situation. So we'll play with that in just a second. And I'll show you some things up here. Other questions? Okay, just real quick. Grazing for better soil health. We've got a fence line contrast, same soil of barns. This pasture side has been uh, not managed as well. It's got more cool seasons invading it. This is a real well-managed pasture. Has a lot of uh, warm season grasses in it. You can kind of even, when you see the soil profiles that we pulled, to me, it's hard with the lighting in here, but this one's lighter. This one has more organic matter. The structure's different, so there's quite a bit of difference. So they poured some water on this, and they tried to see what would happen. What's represented here in the blue is the first inch of moisture they poured on. On the native site, the first inch was gone in 1.2, and that was, that's actually minutes, I believe, that it took for the water to infiltrate. Is that right? Does it say? Inches per hour. Yeah, minutes, minutes. thanks. It's been a long time since I read graphs. <laughs> and I don't really like doing it still, to be honest with you. Anyway, 1.2 minutes, 21 minutes on the invaded. The second inch, that's critical. 27 minutes, a half hour for the second inch, 109 minutes. So it was an hour and a half plus for that second inch on the invaded site. So the key thing of it is, is we can find the same kind of relationships on grasslands and how it's managed. So now what I do, before we play around with this example a little bit, I think what we'll do is we can turn the lights up. Ali, thank you. We'll just pour some water in here and see how this works. I better make sure I got these kind of in the right spot. The fellow you've seen in the video left these for me today kind of by my car before I drove up, so he gave me the tools I need. I'll pass this around. This is what he demonstrated or talked about in the video, but this is what we used to pound into the ground to pull these soil samples out, so I'll just let you pass that around. That's what was done here. We have a pasture situation here that the way Jeff has described it to me is, is this is more of a grazeland situation that's been hit pretty hard. It was a spring pasture. It's been hit pretty hard for quite a few years. And this side over here is a more well-managed native pasture land situation. So I got about two and a half cups of water here. I like measured them out. We'll just pour it in and see what happens. This one didn't turn out as dramatic as I've seen it work in other situations. And that might be the slope or whatever. But it, let's just take a small rainstorm event. I'll just pull these and hold these up right now. This is roughly what we had happen. Now I don't, again, don't focus on the fact that there's a little bit more sediment, a little bit more um, organic matter that's in this one. Just look at the moisture. Not a lot of rain, not a big rainstorm that we just poured on there. But again, if I was trying to manage this land, if I was going to rent this land, and if I had a choice, I would rather rent the one where most of the water went into the soil and where less ran off. That's what I'd want to do. 
And I think what we, we know is we have ideas and we have some techniques and things like that that will help you be able to make that happen on your land, on your crop land, or on your grazing lands. So, enough of that. Questions about that? Oh, sorry, Clay. We're just moving your camera. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Question. <No. laughs> okay. I think it's important that I share just a little bit too about the difference it can make on a landscape scale. I know that maybe in a lot of ways you folks would say you're more most interested in what it means to your operation. And there's a lot of landowners here in the state that I know feel that way and I think it's the right thing. Like I told you, I want you to be selfish with the water that falls on your operation. The key thing of it is though is while it's good for you, it can also have positive things downstream. You know we've been getting some heavy rainfall events, you know we've had some flooding. We had it happen on the Missouri River, we've had it happen on the Mississippi River. When you take these little differences that might seem minute, but when you apply it to a large acreage of land, it makes a big difference. In the Missouri River Basin, which is a large basin, you know, if we could take on the cropland in the Missouri, in the Mississippi River Basin, excuse me, Mississippi River Basin, a half inch, if we could infiltrate one half inch more of moisture on the cropland in the basin, what would that mean? That's the amount of water that flows over Niagara Falls for 83 days. So the point that I would make is, is that if we do good things on the landscape of South Dakota, not only will it be better for the people who own and manage that land, it will also be better for the people downstream. And I think that's part of the focus. That's why I don't really want to focus a lot on the sediment part of this. I don't want to you know, get into arguments about that. I don't think that's important. I think if we just work with you to infiltrate the water, we're going to be on the right path. Okay. Common questions got to be, maybe especially for the NRCS people in the room. Is this all brand new stuff? Are we just learning this about all this stuff about soil health? It's been around a long time. Sometimes that can be frustrating because it seems like, man, we've known this for a long time and we still haven't taken it as far as we want to. But it tells me it's just like there's always pressures and that and the chances for us to take it the next way. But I love this picture. Um, I don't have all the details of this picture. I actually accidentally left them back in here. But I do know that it was a picture that was taken in the 70s, I believe, Hyde County. Um, they're on a fence line contrast, as you can see. You can kind of see from this, this site's a little bit different managed. This almost looks like an area that was excluded. I see a fence here and a fence here, so maybe this was, for some reason, it was excluded. Um, you bet, could be a section line. I love the saying, if you can't read it, don't lose your reins, and they spelled reins two ways. Proper grazing means more grass, more beef, less sediment, pollution, same slope, same soil, rainfall, and taxes. Overgrazing never pays. This rain, 1.81 inches. And what they did roughly is they went and dug down on both sides to see how far, how deep that moisture got in the ground after that rain. This side says 6 inches, this says 17. So this whole idea of soil health and proper grazing management leads to getting more water in the soil, which means to growing more grass. It's been around for a long time. We have the techniques. We just need to really help and have that focus and all work together to make that story told because it'll be the right thing for us. The other part that's so scary to me is a little bit is, especially in like a year following last year, <clears throat> um, we had dry conditions. We grew less grass. We might have had to harvest more grass than we really wanted to because we didn't have a place to go with our livestock or hay. We grew more of that grass. We might have had an impact on the plant. Might have actually really kind of slowed down its development some. We get some rain this year. Let's hope we get normal rain this year. Let's hope we get above normal rain this year. Will that plant respond back as quickly? And the answer is no, it won't because it was impacted last year. It would have been impacted likely even if we had never grazed it. I mean, it went through a stress, you know. Any of us go through stresses. We, it takes us a while to bounce back. Rangeland's the same way. My concern is, is that it just all starts to how all connect. So you grow less grass, which means you grow less organic matter on the surface, which is helps what shades the soil, keeps it cool, helps moisture infiltrate 
provides organic matter. The roots start to die back. They're not as strong. So when you do get rain, maybe you don't infiltrate as much. You don't grow as much grass. You don't grow as many roots. And the soil health thing starts to decline, which means that you don't get as much moisture in the soil. And it just, like I said, it spirals. So it's really like, to me, now is the time to start. There's never a better time than right now. Okay, I'll just make a few closing comments. Really, you know, if you ignore the land or the soil and you push it beyond its capabilities, it's going to have impacts. None of us, if you take me, if you take me and say, okay, Zimbridge, we're going to make you run a marathon tomorrow, you're going to push me way beyond my capabilities. And I'm going to suffer greatly. Um, probably won't even finish the race and would be deathly sick probably for several days if you made me do that. The same thing goes with our natural resources. You can look around and see sometimes we push the land beyond its capabilities. If you ask too much of it, we're going we're gonna to reduce organic matter. We're going to have this soil health thing decline, which is going to have this overall impact to how we can infiltrate moisture, which just kind of turns. All of this is likely going to lead to increased production costs. If you drop organic matter, um, you're going to have to find other ways to replace the nutrient value that comes from that organic matter. Jason can speak to that better than I. But we've got to find a way that can be more sustainable, that we can raise that 70% more food and fiber we need and still sustain our resources. NRCS, along with our technical assistance, we have a variety of programs that can help you implement some practices to make these difference. But really, I think the most important place to start is with a plan. A plan for what you want to do and how you want to do it. And so much can be accomplished without a lot of outlay of money. I want you to know that. So much can be accomplished just with good management. The person who kind of started the Soil Conservation Service with a, was a soil scientist by the name of Hugh Hammond Bennett. One of his famous quotes is, take care of the land and it'll take care of you. And I really believe that that's kind of what we all have to work together on. Us at NRCS with conservation districts and a whole lot of other partners and all the private landowners across the country have to work together to figure out how we can take care of the land and it will take care of us. So with that, I will just say thank you. And if you have any questions or anything like that, I'd be or happy to answer them for a few minutes. I think I might have. I'm just about out of time. Right. Yeah, I think there's questions, please. Yeah. Any questions at all? We'll stay around afterwards and know that there's a lot of local conservationists in the room here. And so make sure that you would visit with them if you have questions in the future. If, if I say something that makes you mad, you don't want to corner me before I get out of here later today. Um, corner one of them. That's a really good deal for me. <laughs> um, they can follow up with me too. But I just want to say that we are here really to help you. I know sometimes the old government joke is, you know, we're from the government, we're here to help you. But we really truly are because it's going to be what's good for all of us. So thank you so you much. Have a question? Yeah. We have a question for you. Yeah, shoot. This effect of uh, drainage and loss of water, do you think that has any influence? Uh, is it is related to the floods that are expected in the Red River Valley this spring? Okay, it's a loaded question. I could make some people upset with my answer, but I'm a, i got to answer, yes, it has an impact. There's no way that we can take a landscape that was created naturally to hold back water, whether it was in the soil or was it within a depression, a pile. And if you tile that or you drain it with surface drainage, how can it not have an impact on downstream flow? Okay? I think we have to learn to figure out how we can have some compromise and accomplish both. I realize that this country is going to have to raise 70% more food. I realize that we may have some wet soils that need to have some manipulation that can actually improve production, but i got to believe we've got to find a way to slow down that amount of water that runs off. We're excited about a new practice that we're calling egg drainage water management. And roughly what it is, is it's a, it's, a, it's, a re, it's a regular tile drainage system, to be honest, with an outlet control structure. So on the end of your tile, there's a structure that allows you to control the level of water in your field. And what it means is in the spring of the year, you could be able to drain that field down some, so you could get in and do your spring work. I hope it's just no-till plant the field. Hope you don't need to do tillage. No-till plant the field. 
and then you could actually close gates and store water back in that soil profile. And then as those crop roots go deeper, you could drop that water in that field with your egg drainage water management system. You could drop it back down in the fall of the year if you needed to. To do harvest, you could actually put the stop logs back in and fill the profile. You're going to hold back water. You're going to have some water available more to help the crop. It's not quite, it doesn't sound, we're always work quite as good as I just said it. Because you have to have rain in there to refill the soil after you've dropped it down, right? So, I mean, there are some hitches. The other thing we're seeing is a way better efficiency on some of our nutrients. Nitrogen. Because that nitrogen leaves that site, too, with the water that leaves the site. So there's some optimism. But I, I have to answer your question. You'd ask me just kind of a short, direct question. The answer has to be yes, there's an impact. There has to be. I don't see any way around it. I know some people maybe don't want to hear that. But there is a downstream impact. Good question. <coughs> Anything else? Thank you for the opportunity. Appreciate it. Do you have a question? Well, I was just wondering on that pasture land, some of that that got used hard, would fertilizing help this spring? I tell you what, there's folks, there's some local range conservationists that are in the room, they're going to speak later, and I would direct that question to them, to be honest. They would have more expertise. I mean, I think there is, there is some research that shows there's some benefit to fertilizer that I've seen, but I've kind of been out of that direct business for a while. I'm going to refer that to experts. I'll ask the question for you if we want to get to that later. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Jeff. You bet. Thank you.